So I'm just accepting. Oh, so I've lost twice. Oh, well, at least I'm consistent. Um, <laughs> so our next session is our Speak to the Expert session, and we're going to invite our panelists. So Relita Camacho Thomas. Give her a round of applause. Janella Bradshaw. We should make y'all run up like, um, like, like, uh, yeah, yes. Okay, 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 okay. Janella, you have to, you have to run in. We have music. We can't let them run in. Okay. collecting this data so that we can inform management. But now we want to get into how are we actually managing our spaces. So each of these ladies here represent either an organization or agency that's doing some level of management in specific ecosystems or in protected areas. All right, And what they're going to be speaking about is how they're doing that. How are, what systems are they using, whether there are systems that actually do exist for them to manage, where the gaps exist for management, and kind of how we can weather some of the challenges of managing, whether we are NGOs or government or statutory organizations. So I think that because we've had, in the morning we had our initial start of chat, with somebody from a statutory organization, I'm going to start with an NGO. And because it's EAG's thing, I'm going to start with Janella, because I can. So Janella is going to come. She's going to give a brief um, overview of how she is managing the Redonda Ecosystem Reserve and some of the gaps and ways that we are using to help with figuring out that management. So welcoming Janella, who's not going to run up on stage again, because that that's done. Okay. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So it's time to talk about your favorite Offshore Island Redonda. Okay? Okay. Um, so we're talking about Redonda managing ecosystems, yesterday restored, tomorrow protected, and kind of how does management look for this offshore island that's on its part um, of restoration and also on its part to being designated as a protected area. Oh. Okay, okay. Well, yes. So if you haven't heard about Redonda, um, Redonda's transformation story is definitely a success. It can be described from literally being transformed from rats to riches. So you had this island um, that was once steaming with wildlife, bursting, but because of invasive rats and goats that was on the island, it literally destroyed everything. The island was dying. There was no vegetation cover. Um, there was one, literally one um, resident land bird living on the island. The cliffs were falling into the sea. It was a disaster. Um, so in 2016, the Redonda Restoration Program was formed, and 
and they were they had the big task of restoring Redonda. And they did so rightfully. So one year after eradication, removing approximately 6,000 rats. There were 6,000 rats on the island. And they were actually, they were so hungry, they were eating each other. Just imagine that. And this little orange tent right there, Rulio was sleeping in that tent. Can you imagine? Rulio, put a comment in the Zoom chat and let them know how difficult it was. But yes, um, Redondo was well on its way um, to being restored. You can see how it looks one year post-eradication. And you can see how it looks um, three years post-eradication. It literally went from zero to 100 real quick. Um, and this was simply done by just removing those negative, those invasive species that was causing negative impacts on the island. So after we have done this, what next for Redondo? Well, I'm happy to introduce you to the Redonda Ecosystem Reserve. <laughs> and the Redonda Ecosystem Reserve will be the first protected marine area under the Environmental Protection Management Act of 2019. And we're very excited about this. This is a big win for conservation. This is a big win for Antiguans and Barbudans. So here, um, our RER for short is one of the three core sister programs we here we have here at the Environmental Awareness Group, and it adopts um, an ecosystem approach. So that means we talk about the integration of the land, the sea, the living um, animals, and everything happening together. So we look at everything as a whole. And right now, RER focuses on the management of Redonda and its surrounding waters, and including those special species, those endemic lizard species you can find on Redonda, as well as the globally significant um, nesting seabirds that we have here. So right now, just to give you a little overview, this is how the protected area would look. So it actually covers around 30,000 hectares, and uh, you're probably saying, how big is that? So that's actually as big as Antigua right now. So if you can see this, these blue dots, that's the entire protected area right there. And in the middle alone, this little, little yellow dot, that's just the island of Redonda. So you can see that majority of the, marine, of the protected area is, consists of the surrounding waters. And you're probably wondering, but how you all going to manage that? I asked myself the same question too, but we are here for it. Um, and you know, with Redonda being so far away, as in, you know, it's not just a little boat ride, like if you go to Bird Island or Green Island, you know, we have to take a helicopter to reach there. So it's really like, what systems are you going to put in place to manage Redonda? So the first step um, is definitely to have an effective and concise management plan. And you want a management plan um, that really focuses and outlines the management goals and the objectives of the protected area. So what are you going to be focusing on? What are those key problematic um, areas that the management plan um, will cover? And as well, you also want this to be flexible because you're not going to cover everything in the management plan. And you want a management plan that will guide you and to guide your governance. So for Redonda, we actually have three key management goals. The first one is called, the first one is regards, takes into consideration species and ecosystem conservation and management. So this is us going over there collecting data. We heard this morning the importance about data and everything we do at the EAG is data driven. We don't make decisions just because we feel like. We make decisions because we have the numbers, we look at the gaps in the research and we say, hey, this is what we need to focus on. The ground um, lizards on Redonda, we notice that their numbers are de decreasing so we need to write a project or find research what's really going on about that. So that, uh, the species and ecosystem conservation management concerns that and also our marine surveys and we have biosecurity checks. So we go over to Redonda quarterly, four times a year to make sure that um, there are no, there are no in invasive species, that, it's re that the island remains rat free. And one thing to take into consideration about conservation, just because we remove those invasive species, the monitoring is continuous and you need money to fund this monitoring. And then you have awareness. How, much of you, how many of you guys have watched the Redonda documentary? Let me see the hands. Whoa! But 
Well, if you haven't, you should know about Redonda, the road to recovery. So for us at the EAG, awareness is a big part of what we do. People can't appreciate the work that we do unless they know about it. So we said, hey, Redonda has a beautiful story. Let's make a documentary to share that story with the public. And ever since we've been doing so since um, June of 2022, the public has been receptive. People are happy. People are proud to know about the work that we're doing. They want us to continue, and this is what we want. We want everybody to be proud. We want everybody to continue and to promote the protection of Redonda. And as well, um, we focus on access and visitation so thinking about um, future research so if maybe somebody from abroad or here say hey I want to look into um, the brown boobies I want to look know more about them so we focus about that aspect as well and as well as the heritage Redonda has a very rich heritage it has a lot of um, archaeological artifacts over there and we're looking into protecting them and promoting that and the most important thing for me is the governance and the management. This protected area cannot be successful unless we have a proper governance and management structure because we don't want the Redondi Ecosystem Reserve to be a protected area only on paper. We want it to actually work. So as such, we have our um, governance and management structure. So there are three key parts to this. You have the protected area board, and this authority, this, this area, they are responsible for giving authority, oversight, and direction and approval to the protected area management agency in the blue. And this will be EAG. So we go out there and we do all the hard work, which we love. We gather the data, um, we do the analysis, we talk to people, we do the reports, we look for funding to continue doing the work that we do. And based on everything we have, we then have our protected area technical advisory committee where we would inform and consult them. So we would have our TAC meetings and we would say, okay, um, we just had our marine surveys in Redonda. These are the findings. These are the next steps. What are your thoughts? Um, and then the technical advisory committee would then advise the management board and bring them up to date. So we have a system, and the system is put into place to make sure that we are accountable, to make sure that what's written in the management plan, that we're actually doing that. And then next, um, one important part is to have um, partnership. Everything pertaining around Redonda is built on the pillars of partnership. We realize that we cannot do it alone. Redonda is a very special island. We need different people with different um, technical expertise, so we built upon that. So when we were doing our consultations for um, the, the protected area designation, I remember I had a meeting with Coast Guard, and they said to me, but wait, you all don't have anybody um, regarding security on your management board, and I said, but you're right. He said, Redonda is so far away, you need to consider that aspect. So we talk, about, we talk to these people and we involve everyone and they say, hey, you need to have this. So then what, what are we doing? We're going to have um, MOU um, with, course, with Defense Force and then we're going to work along with them. And they said, hey, you know what? Maybe we can include um, Redonda into our patrol plan. So you know the Coast Guard, they would go to different areas doing their patrol, they have their air wing, and they would, you know, we're working along with them to ensure the management of Redondo. And you may recognize some people in this photo, but yes, and this was taken on January the 5th when we went to do our biosecurity check. So we see we have NP in the photo, we have our board members, we have our team, so we can't do it alone. So every single aspect, we need people, we need the skills to get the work done. And then, talk, just to talk a little bit about the challenges, especially with Redonda, um, accessibility is one of them. And when I mean accessibility, I mean like, as I said, Redonda, we have to go on, a, we have to take a helicopter to go to Redonda. So we have to take that into consideration when we're talking about management. Somebody can't be stationed there 24 seven. So how are we gonna monitor this space? How are we gonna see who is using this space? What are people doing? So we have to think about these challenges. Currently now, um, we're gonna test out having cameras on Redonda and they're gonna be solar powered where that they would pick up certain images and if anything unusual is happening, they would send um, the image back to us um, and then we can better analyze and we can also use this data to see what's happening when we're not there because we're only there 
at minimum four times a year. So that's not a lot of um, days. So a lot of things can happen when we're not there. Um, high transportation costs. So every flight we take to Redonda is like 3,200 US. And that's a lot of money. So that's every time we go there. And it's only four times minimum we go there a year. So we have to think about how can we raise money for us to continue doing that work, for us to continue monitoring, because that's not something that we can't do. We need to monitor, because as Relita was saying earlier, we need to collect that data, that have that pro programmatic data to see what's going on so we can monitor trends and we can know how the recovery of the island is doing, and also to identify gaps so we can attend to them. And you know the big thing for I think most um, CSOs and NGOs, um, the need for a sustainable financial mechanism. We need to find a way that we have money coming in to support the work that we do. Because it's not, it's not cheap and it takes a lot of funds and we want to continue to make sure we have um, sustainable use of this resource. And as well, the novelty of managing um, such a large marine protected area. Um, Redonda presents its own special characteristics, and this is going to be a new thing for all of us. EAG has not done this before. We will be in a public-private partnership with the government of Antigua and Barbuda to manage this island. They're saying, hey, you guys are good at what you do, so we're going to give this duty to you but we want you to work along with us. So this is gonna be a new thing and we really want this to work because we want people to see that, hey, we can manage a protected area. This can work and we can do it with the government and also be an NGO. And that wraps up my presentation. And as well, since we're talking about sustainable financial mechanisms, Redonda has merch. So if you have some money in your pocket and you want to be decked out in a nice Redonda shirt and you want to promote the continuous conservation of this beautiful island, feel free to see me later and purchase a nice little shirt. All right? Thank you. Thank you, Jodella. Of course, there's merch. Um, thank you, Janella. Uh, now I'm going to turn over to Rafika to speak about managing a protected area. And we do know the challenges with Wallings. So I'm very interested to hear from her um, not just what those challenges are, but how do we then mitigate against those potential gaps that we're seeing as a result of the fallout? <laughs> Good afternoon. First, let me start by saying that Wallings Nature Reserve Incorporated is not the name of the location, which we spend most of our days on social media correcting. So it reads, Wallings Nature Reserve located in the Wallings Forest area. So we never change the, the, the location's name. The company's name is Wallings Nature Reserve Incorporated. It's a conservation company and uh, it's a not-for-profit governed by the laws of Antigua and Barbuda. What stands out for this organization is that we would have already built in a mechanism with sustainability when we were designing it. So I spend most of my days now speaking to places like the Bahamas, St. Lucia, Trinidad, Jamaica, seeing how organizations that already exist can incorporate sustainability into the business right away. So there's a grant side and there's a business side. The situation that escalated to the point that it got is unfortunate because the area has now gotten back and looks worse than what it was when we began to restore the area in 2018. Ironically, um, the terrestrial area is the forest and there's not a lot of communication within the government sector. We've been working along with the Ministry of Tourism, the department, the mini the department um, Department of Environment, um, Community Development Division, other divisions within the, ministry, the um, government sector. What we've always had was a challenge with the Ministry of Agriculture. So even when these government agencies were stepping in to bridge the gap that existed, we still had issues going forward with the development. 
we had a temporary agreement where every time we had to apply for funding, we would have to get letters of support from those government agencies to say that this was what was happening. So Wallings Nature Reserve Incorporated has completed over 12 projects. We've managed to raise over 300,000 US within the space of four years, the short space of time that we've been working. And the development of the Wallings Forest area was just one project that we were doing as a company with regards to conservation in Antigua and Barbuda. And it was a peeve of mine that this area located right there in the heart of my backyard. Um, I want to get away from home and take up food from home and go in the bush go cook. And I saw an opportunity not just to make money but to develop the space into something that we could all relate to. What we created while we were there um, was a, a protected areas management effective analysis report. We had, uh, we created a MET tool assessment while we were there. We started working with the Department of Environment on a draft management plan for the Shirkley Mountain areas because we have this tendency in Antigua and Barbuda to be referring to things that are dated older than me, 1912 and 70 something coming down. We don't like to update things. And then we started doing a draft gap analysis for the management of the protected areas. So all of the key stakeholders that would come together to ensure that the project survived. And then we started drafting a priority action plan for that protected area. It was never the intent of the company to stay within that space forever because we were becoming overwhelmed and the challenges that we were facing were a lot unnecessary. All right, what we've managed to do, and we still have the responsibility, we managed to protect the Wallings Forest Reserve with IUCN. So if you go to the internet and you see www.protect, um, the planet.net, Redonda is on there. Redonda is on there. So we would have managed to get Walling's forest area protected. And if you notice, it's a terrestrial inland water protected area. It's highlighted here in green. And the location is Antigua and Barbuda. And this can be found on the internet. What you're noticing now, the management authority, see the difference there? Walling's Nature Reserve Incorporated, however, the Wallings Forest area was what we would have managed to protect. This information came from um, the Department of Environment, so I guess they reached out to ensure that the information that we were giving them was accurate and to the point. And again, we are still we are not in the location, but because of the um, agreements that we would have forged with international bodies, we are still the management company for that location. All right, we started reforesting Signal Hill. And Signal Hill also on national parks, and they appreciate the work we're doing up there. Julio can tell you that in the Zoom chat if he's still there. We started to remove the invasive lemongrass species and plant fruit trees. We managed to plant over 1,500 trees. We had a situation where animals were deliberately let go to eat the plants. What the team has been doing now with another donor is that we still hike every Sunday. And a team of four persons, three females and a male, and this is the girls that work at Wallings, and more male than female, because if we need to use a chainsaw, a cutlass, a weed whacker, we do not look at it as work. We look at it as having fun, doing something we love, so it doesn't bother us. So we have an area that is thriving with food and forestries. So in a few years, persons decide to use that space. They can hike to Signal Hill, and they can get... Um, Sugar apple, golden apple. So you can just walk with your sugar, mix your juice up there. Um, sour sap. We've been planting things that we realize, and what we've noticed is that the Antiguan black pineapple is thriving within that space, and it doesn't need lots of maintenance. So you know we're planting a lot of pineapple. All right, the challenges face. Um, there's a series of as I mentioned before, with communication with government agencies, not relaying the information because when the, the um, situation happened, they realized, oh, you're supposed to be working along with the Department of Environment, which we were, and the Ministry of Tourism, which we were, and something that we were doing while we're at Wallings, we were collecting data as to how many persons were accessing the space, how often they came, what was the area that they frequented the most? And this information was being shared with the Ministry of Tourism so they could then say, okay, this area of the island is getting this much traffic. And the Department of Environment was using it to see how much damage was being created to the flora and fauna within that location. All right, the lessons learned. 
The persons within the sectors, we do not like to educate ourselves with the current actions with regards to climate change because persons are of the opinion that we just like to hike and be sweaty and go and dig out lemongrass and plant food. That's not the case. We are currently working along with the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Forest Service. Two persons from Antigua and Barbados will be leaving shortly to be trained as regional fire jumpers. Hopefully I'm one of those so that we can service the whole wider region with regards to how wildfires are managed because the lemongrass is not lit by itself. I try to light it and it's not lighting. Persons put things in place so that it lights, and when the wind is blowing, that's going to take off a whole hill, and every time the hill is lit, we lose 80% of the forest every single time, and it takes a while for it to grow back. All right? This seems to be a uh, power. Persons want to be in charge, but persons don't want to do the work, so they're of the opinion that, um, let me push buttons, and some of the technicians are too comfortable within the space that they're given, abuse their power, because when they're supposed to be checking to ensure that things are supposed to be going in such a certain way, they actually don't do that. All right, where are we now? We're working on adaptation, and we are working on becoming a partner for GCF. We've been going through the training for the past two years. It has been quite tedious, and we have partnered with the International Institute for Inter environment and development and world resources institute we're now featured on their website so we're one of those voices that you can um hear within right right little antigua and barbuda and the caribbean with regards to advocacy and we have new partners in miami and we have a partner in chile right now that we have one hectare of signal hill and we are being featured as the only Caribbean island so far. I've been mentioning other NGOs so that they can be featured on this international scale with regards to how um, conservation, whether it be marine, whether it be land, whether it be sea, anything that we're doing in Antigua and Barbuda, how the work that is being done by one small organization and it trickles over. Thank you, Rafika. So I've, I know that we've heard from Relita before about her management systems. So I really want to hear from Helena about the protected area system that the Department of Environment has developed. So can you speak? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? Doesn't sound like you can hear me, but okay, now you can hear me. Very good. Thank you. Sorry I don't have a presentation, but I'm so I'm gonna speak about um, the so one of the projects was help was designed to help develop something called the National Protected Area Systems Plan. And I want to talk about how that relates to all of this. So the idea behind why we would need such a thing is so that protected areas can be managed holistically, that, the, that we manage things in the way, in, in, in a similar manner and pull on each other's experience when we are managing protected areas. So there is now a National Protected Area Systems Plan and it is designed to do this, to help us manage protected areas more effectively. Now, we had, the, the consultant had worked with all the folks that work with protected areas, spoke with Rafika, um, I don't think Janela was there as yet. I know that um, National Parks was a significant um, resource in the development of that plan because as you could see, National Parks is actually operating a very successful protected area. It's sustainable on its own and, and we're very proud and always when we hear Relita speak about it, we're always proud of their accomplishments because they are very successful and they're moving, they're moving quickly and, 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 and in the direction of um, data collection to, with a view of biodiversity, conservation and sustainable use. So therefore, the idea behind this plan is to then look at where, look at, look, look at how we can get together to share experiences. So under that plan is a committee called the Protected Area Management Committee, and the idea behind that is to have a National Parks Authority as a senior advisor on that, and all the folks that manage protected areas become part of this committee. It, both NGOs, both government agencies, and that we work together to ensure that 
protected areas are managed holistically as opposed to everything piecemeal and we don't know how we're going to do things. So one of the gaps that the consultant found, well, three of the areas that the consultant found, and it's not only in Antigua and Barbuda, it's throughout the region, the three areas why protected areas generally fail are because of three main things. Staff, having consistent staffing available, having training for the staff, and having a budget. Because if you don't have a budget, an operational budget, well, how are you going to pay your staff? How are you going to pay your, for your programs to, to do the work, to do your data collection? Because Janela said, how much is it? 3,500 US? 32. It's 35. And, it, and yes. that's, only for US. The, that's only for the day trip. And that's the one trip. The day and you, trip. The one not day the, trip. Not that's not even the overnight. When they have to overnight. Right. Okay. Yes. So it's, it's expensive. So we have to have a budget. We have to find ways around that. So the idea behind the plan is to do, to do things in a, in, in a cooperative or collaborative manner among all the agencies and to find actual solutions. And that was the idea behind the plan. So, that, uh, so, so I know that um, there, there was envisioned at some point that the SURF fund would be able to provide operational funding, but we'll have to see how that works out because we, I don't think the SURF fund is at that stage yet where it can to do that, but it's a hope that in, fu in future it can. But we would have to then work about how we can gain donors. I know the EAG works really hard to, to get funding, and we, we try our best to help them as much as possible in our little capacity. And other donors are constantly are, are also part of that process. Um, so the idea behind the systems plan is to make it a process where we're all working together with and sharing best practices and sharing our experiences. because. It doesn't make sense that we are doing our own little silo work. It's important that we are collaborative. Janelle alluded to that in our work, and we and and, and Rafika as well. It, we have to work together to make this the, this process um, useful. Because at the end of the day, we are all working. Well, we are all trying to work too. We hope, as somebody said, they we hope that we're all working to, biodiversity conservation sustainable use because biodiversity is depending on underpinning of all our lives and our survival depends on it. So thank you. Thank you, Helena. So now, one of the things I've noticed across um, all of your programs, and Relita would have al alluded to it in her presentation earlier as well, is the need for like that cross-agency support. So you would have heard like, and you saw a picture, for instance, that National Parks was out with us on Redonda and that Rafika, for instance, had Community Development Division, Tourism, Department of Environment, all working on the same thing. Same thing with um, National Parks, working with EMC and all of that. I have a question for you, Relita. As, okay, so for us as an NGO, figuring out that collaboration is not, I think it's, it's, it's been easier because we've, we've kind of figured out, okay, this is what we want and this is who we need to call. But how does it work for a statutory body where um, your, how you work is based on law? Whereas when, I mean, EAG, we, we can essentially get up one morning and make a decision. Whereas with you, you can't do that. How does that kind of collaboration figure into how you manage? Well, I think it makes it easier, actually, mm -hmm. because it's very clear where our mandate is, right? So we have very clear boundaries that we operate in, and we have a very clear um, mandate. So we know the things that we are responsible for. Also, because we're a government agency, it tends to make relationship with other government agencies easier, right? So you get into the door easier, and people tend to talk to you easier because you're friendly fire. Even if we fire, it's friendly fire because we're all working for the government. I think, though, that um, what, will, what has made it easier is that we have the Environmental Management and Protection Act which is a public statement that the government is committed to certain things. And so, and also the government is committed to these various MEAs that we can then look back into 
and so that we can be certain that we are aligning with what has been identified as a national priority. Um, however, having said that, we are a community of people and uh, although we have these common goals that are enshrined in documents, many people don't know what's in the document. Um, there would have been, cons even, even in the park, uh, the National Parks Development Plan was done in 1984. I was four years old. Um, so if I wasn't interested and didn't read the document and didn't go back and do the research, then I would not know what's in the plan. And therefore, while we are executing what have been identified as priorities, we have to realize that those priorities would have been identified when the current generation were not even born or may have been children. And therefore, as an, a management agency, we have to continue to, I don't want to use the word awareness because I don't think awareness is what we need to do. We need to ensure that we communicate the value of natural resources. I, what we have seen is that we do public awareness campaigns with a project for six months and then we stop, right? And then six years later, we expect the people we're talking to to know what we communicated six years before. It doesn't work that way. Um, there are two ways we can do that. Uh, and that is, it. when I say do that, I mean instilling the value. Because it's people that we serve, and if the people, if people who we are serving don't want the service, then it makes no sense. Um, so we have a responsibility. So we're talking to ourselves in this room, right? Let's just admit that. We are talking to ourselves. Um, we understand, all of us understand what we're talking about, and we are having fun here and we're enjoying each other, and we're having nice conversation, but we're not actually addressing the problem. And the problem is, how do we get people to learn about what we know, love what we love, and protect what we are trying to protect? That is still a challenge, um, because in this room, uh, there's 75 of us here. How many people here? So you have. 75 different priorities in this room, 75 different perspectives of what is valuable for individual lives, and that's just in this room. Can you imagine dealing with a community of 2,000 people who are resident there and other people who come in and interact with it? That is the challenge. Um, what we need is to learn to be marketers, right? <laughs> Which. <laughs> which I see, you know, we have some lovely branding and all of that going on, right? But we as scientists don't learn to sell the product. We learn about data and fact and, you know, we think that once we present this thing, you should know. It doesn't work like that in reality. There are two ways that I have learned to do it. Individual conversations, and you can't present what you want first. You first have to learn what are the values of the person you're speaking to. So that makes you have to step back to every t everything you think you know and you think is right. You have to push that aside and you have to open yourself to listen to who you're talking to. What is valuable? So interestingly, right? that is what will be covered oh, in the next I'm session. I'm so and sorry. Let but that's stop. great that your <laughs> brain is going there and recognizing that part of our challenge is the communication. Um, but I was also thinking when you were you're speaking about um, you know like one person's communication program starts and it ends in six months. If we are this room of 75 or this grouping of people all talking together about what we are actually doing, perhaps there would be no end to that conversation if. At your six months, because you have no more money, and that's okay. We all understand it. You have no more money, your project is ended at that point. Is there, are there components of your project that can be incorporated into somebody else's communications so that there is that continuous messaging and we all have different target audiences? 
I think that if we, especially because um, Helena, you're speaking about like a national protected area system where everybody is supposed to be managing together and we are not on our phones, but we have put them on silent, um, there <laughs> would be, there would be, um, you know, like even from that perspective, we could feed information up to the protected air system plan so that everybody knows, okay, this is where we're going this year and these are the gaps. Would that make sense? Is that even feasible? I mean, it's funding depend. It's, uh, it's always funding dependent, but it's also that where, for instance, where now Rafika is still doing work on her areas, that there is support for her from women against rape from a very random side of things that have maybe not necessarily directly correlated to her tree planting, but still the the community that women against rape is is targeting will get that kind of information or the wellness from going and assisting Rafika with tree planting. So there's, I think that there are ways for us to make connectivity even within our work plans. That may be a pie in the sky hope. Um, so I know that our time is nearly up. I think for me, the last question I have for each of you, each of you ladies, I just realized that. Is that weird that I just realized that they're all women? Yes. <laughs> all women doing protected area management, doing the hard work. <laughs> um, my last question to you is within the next, um, I guess the next, two years, so not even five years, in the next two years, what are you hoping to see in terms of management of your protected area or the areas that you are managing? So I'm gonna start, I'll start with you, Helena. Okay, so I'll go down the line. Oh, thank you. There we go. Right, so in two years, me, I, ex I would love that the SMMA is actually protected. I would love that the protected... Sure Curly Mountain Management sure Area. Sure Curly Mountain Managed <laughs> Area. SMMA. Yes, and I would love that the Protected Areas Management Committee is robust and running and effective in ensuring that protected areas are being managed effectively. That is my two-year dream. Okay, as a part of the SMA, I think. <laughs> SMMA. Although um, Wallings Nature Reserve Incorporated is no longer within the Wallings Forest area, it would be a travesty to see the area is already going back to what it was because nobody's holding anybody accountable and person is just doing what they feel like however with the recognition internationally as the area being protected hopefully we can fight against any development going in to destroy the forest because of the work that we've already put in on the ground and in two years we're supposed to be able to have south swap ice pops from signal hill Um, for me, with regards to Redonda, well, in two years, it will be designated before that. But yes, it will be designated as a protected area. But also um, that we will be not only collecting data, but collecting data and publishing that data and sharing it with like the wider community. So our protected area can be like a model for other areas within the region. They can say, hey, how did you guys do this? I want to learn from you. And also for us to, um, you know, to get our sustainable financial mechanism, have some low impact eco tours happening um, within the marine protected area and finalizing our um, zoning plan. Right, for the Nelson's Dockyard National Park, um, in two years, we would like to see a marine spatial zoning plan um, being implemented. 
and we would also like to see a terrestrial zoning plan implemented. Um, I am going to piggyback on others because we, all, we link with all of these other protected areas. So for us, biodiversity corridors are very, very important and they're important for resilience. We all operate somewhere across the southwest area of Antigua. And for me, I would like to see all of us be collaborating to create um, biodiversity corridors and to realistically manage them as fully protected corridors. And I think that is important given the development pressures that we face and the fact that we are a developing country, we need to make sure these corridors exist. Thank you. I think that all that, all that, all the things that y'all require, require us to have very great communication, very good engagement and stakeholder planning. And so I'm now going to invite Nathan to introduce our next speaker, or sorry, Josh, to introduce our next speakers and thank our lovely panel for being here.